Hi everyone, my name is Michael Carney and I'm an ecologist at the School of Biosciences at the University of Melbourne. And I'm really excited to be part of this ecological niche modelling course that Town's put together. Thanks Town for the invitation to give a talk on something called mechanistic niche modelling. So it's something um, very relevant to what you're doing, um, but uh, not quite the same as most of what you've heard so far, but hopefully you'll find it um, complementary and uh, interesting and that it will enhance your understanding of the sorts of things you've been learning in the course uh, thus far. So this is the frontiers section of the course. Many of the ideas I'll be telling you about are very old ideas that have been around for a very long time, but it's only in relatively recent times that we've tried to apply these ideas to um, understand how organisms are distributed in, distributed in space. And also um, what I'm going to tell you about each, um, I'm going to break, break the talk up into four talks. Um, so first I'm going to talk about what is a mechanistic niche model. Uh, second, I'll be telling you about heat budgets and microclimates. Then I'll talk about energy budgets and how we integrate those with heat budgets and microclimates. Um, and then finally, I'll, I'll provide an overview of the, of the process and how we can potentially integrate it with correlative models. So that's the plan. But each of these topics, like what a mechanistic niche model is and some of the theory behind that, what a heat budget is and how we do that, the study of microclimates, the study of energy budgets, they could all be uh, the subject of a course just as long as this one. So you're necessarily getting a very brief overview, but as I say, uh, hopefully enough that uh, you, you, know, you, you might find uh, you've learned enough about it to decide whether you might want to pursue it further, or you might be able to just use the concepts associated with these kinds of models to help you better understand what you're doing in uh, the field of correlative modeling which of course this subject is mostly focused. Now I really love correlative distribution modeling. It's uh, something that really captivated me when I was doing my uh, PhD and I was working on pathogenetic creatures and trying to understand their environmental relationships and um, published a couple of papers back in 2003 using correlative models to, to look at this, uh, this issue of pathogenesis um, in a grasshopper, um, you can see on the left, Warramaba virgo, and a gecko, you can see on the right, Bino's gecko, Heteronodia binoei. And we were interested in problems of um, the geographic, the biogeography bio of these animals, how they were spreading across the landscape, had they finished spreading. You can see in this prediction we made for the range of the parthenogenetic Bino's geckos, it suggests that they may not have finished spreading. But also wanted to ask questions about uh, the environmental associations of these geckos uh, and grasshoppers and their the sexual species that gave rise to them. And so this figure here is showing um, in, um, in, multi, in multivariate environmental space the environmental conditions of the two sexual species that gave rise to the parthenogens with the solid circles and the two and two of the different parthenogenetic lineages. So I, I, I appreciate um, how we can use correlative models of species distributions to make inferences about um, aspects of in environmental associations of species, things we can think of as the niche. But as I was going through this process, I started to ask myself, what, what do I think a niche means? And um, you know, as, as Town has said, there are many, many different definitions of niches, and I think as Jorge has said as well, um, it, we even say it differently. I'm saying niche, not niche. Um, but uh, I thought to myself, what do I think a niche is in relation to, to habitat and environment, uh, two other really fundamental concepts in ecology? And I found myself feeling a little bit embarrassed that at the level of having, you know, doing a PhD, I wasn't really clear um, what the distinction was in my mind of a habitat, an environment and a niche. But actually, I mean, at the time, I'd asked my colleagues and friends, and they were all similarly vague on, on this problem. So I had a, a bit of a think about it, and, and you know, especially in the context of understanding species distributions, not, you know, there's, there's different ways to use the niche concept, especially in the original um, idea of understanding competition and so on. But here's what I came up with anyway, the way I think about the distinction between habitat, niche, and environment. 
and this guides how I um, describe the notion of a mechanistic niche model. So I'll just go into it first of all in a little bit of detail and you can see, uh, read more about what I'm thinking here in this paper in Oikos from 2006. Um, so you know, here we have a, a desert scene. This is a scene where you do find the Bionos gecko. This is out near Kalgoorlie um, in Western Australia. Uh, also running around uh, under these bushes, uh, these little uh, diurnal skinks, um, also parthenogenetic actually. And this tree here is called a mulga tree. That's also an asexual tree. So there's food chains. Oh, there's grasshoppers also on these bushes that are parthenogenetics and there's whole food chains of asexual creatures out there in the desert, but that's another story. Um, so habitat, here's what I come up with as a concept for habitat. Simply a description of a physical place at some scale of space and time where an organi organism actually lives or potentially lives. So uh, if we're thinking about this place here, this scene out in Kalgoorlie, uh, we could describe this scene as a, as a desert habitat, a place where temperature fluctuates widely through a day, where rainfall fluctuates um, widely across years and is generally low and not necessarily referred to an organism in the process of describing the habitat. And, and you could describe a habitat on Mars as well um, without necessarily referring to an organism, but it's a place, a configuration of, of, of things in space and time where an organism might live. And then environment, um, the word environment means that which uh, surrounds. So it, something has to be surrounded. And of course that is the organism. So the environment is the biotic and abiotic phenomena that are surrounding and potentially interacting with an organism. And you can uh, see with these two lizard examples, the diurnal gray skink and the nocturnal binos gecko, that organisms in the same habitat can experience completely different environments. So the gray skink is experiencing solar radiation shining on it um, because it's coming out during the day and it's experiencing very high temperatures, whereas the binos gecko hiding during the day underground uh, and, and is never really seeing the sun. And then um, the niche is, you can see I've got this hierarchical structure here. So environments are found within habitats and then niches are subsets of environments. And they're the subset of environmental conditions which affect a particular organism's fitness. And they're that subset of conditions where the organism, um, well, the ab absolute fitness of individuals of that type of organism are able to um, maintain a population where the population growth rate is greater than one. So um, not all environmental variables are going to be necessarily relevant to an organism. So, you know, the, the particular wavelengths of red and blue light are really important for the plant in, in, in this figure here, but they're relatively unimportant for the gecko. The magnetic fields around these, um, these living things aren't necessarily that important. They may be important for a bird for navigation, but they're not important for the organisms. So it's a subset of environmental conditions that are strongly affecting fitness. And it's um, within those particular environmental conditions, it's the subset of those, the ranges of those conditions that allow the organism to persist. Now, what we're interested in in this course is understanding the environmental associations of organisms. Um, to understand why they're distributed, how they are in space, but also, um, also to understand what limits their distribution. How, is environmental, how are environmental conditions constraining organisms? And there are two ways we can go about understanding this problem using environmental layers. We have all these amazing environmental layers available to us. We want to make this connection between um, the, the niche of the organism and those environmental layers. And of course, what you're focused on mostly in this course is the correlative approach, where you start with the distribution points, with the occurrence points, and you develop a, a, a model of how um, those occurrence points are related to the environmental variables. And this is necessarily a process implicit approach. Extremely powerful because of the fact that these models will pick up any statistical association um, between the processes that actually limit the organism, that constrain those distribution points and the environmental layers. But you can't easily unpack what you got, what processes you caught in that, in that model. Um, what I'm 
wanting to talk to you about in, in these um, mini lectures is how we can do this in a process explicit way through your mechanistic niche model. Now, those organisms, um, I mean, the example organisms I was talking about before, the, the lizards, uh, I mentioned how their environment experience is really strongly uh, dependent on their behaviour. So one's nocturnal, one's diurnal, and that's just one example of how organisms actually construct their environments, how tightly related the traits of the organism are um, to the environment experienced. And to do mechanistic niche modelling, what we really need to do is start with the traits. We don't start with the distribution points, but we start with the traits and we try to go from there um, to an understanding of the environmental constraints. But there are a number of challenges and steps there. Um, and there are many, many different processes that could be constraining an organism. So where on earth do we start? How do we, how do we st try to um, work on this puzzle? It's a real puzzle. Um, so one good place to start is with thermodynamics. Um, so thermodynamics is that part of physics which is concerned with the exchange of, of heat between, uh, between a system and its environment and also uh, the exchange of matter. And thermodynamic processes are, are very fundamental, they're occurring all the time. And what you do in a thermodynamic analysis is you define a system, uh, that's part of the, you know, part of the problem, how do you, what do you define as the system? And then once you've defined a system, you follow the flows of energy and material in and out of that system, and you write equations that give you the dynamics of those flows. And organisms, um, individual organisms are a very uh, natural boundary around which to um, to define a thermodynamic system and of course you know heat budgets are, are fundamental to um, living things in the first place so um, we can define a system boundary around an organism like this lizard which you can see um, in infrared um, this is a little military dragon from um, uh, that I spotted once in the desert in uh, in Central Australia. So we have the concept of the system, which is the organism itself, the surroundings and the boundary. And then we can follow the flows of energy in and energy out of the system. Um, and that is uh, the case of a um, closed thermodynamic system where you have only energy coming in and out of the, of the system. But in an open thermodynamic system, um, which, which is represented by that dashed, dashed line around the organism, um, we're also getting flows of mass in and out of the system. And the first law of thermodynamics is that that um, energy going in plus the energy going out plus any energy stored has to balance, has to sum up uh, to zero. And the same with the mass going in, the mass going out and the mass stored um, must obey that first law. And that's really powerful in enabling us to um, develop the equations to try and understand how these things are flowing in and out of the organism. And of course, how energy in the form of heat, in the form of chemical energy, how mass in the form of building blocks is going in and out of the organismal system is absolutely fundamental to um, the process of that organism growing, developing, surviving, reproducing, and therefore persisting. So we can think of thermodynamic processes really basically as the fundamental requirements for life. Um, being at the right temperature, uh, respiring, or breathing, having enough water, and exchanging, um, or having having enough food and exchanging, picking up chemical substrates for, from the environment and using them to run the metabolism and grow the organism. And I've called these fundamental things, um, temperature, breathing, water, and feeding, because they go together in a particular way that I can I can make happen. They're interconnected. These processes and um, that that's the sort of simple view of it that that um, the process of feeding interlocks with and is coupled to the process of respiration um, process, the process of heat exchange all these things are coupled and as so is the exchange of water um, with temperature that's the that's the simple view so here is a more detailed version of that uh, diagram and what we have here is in the heat budget term a series of terms that relate to different quantities of heat being exchanged through different processes. We'll go through these in more detail in the next part of this lecture, but just briefly, we've got solar radiation coming in, uh, infrared radiation coming in, and heat being generated by the organism. 
come, these are input terms, and then these terms on the other side are generally output terms. There's heat being lost by infrared radiation, heat being exchanged by convection, evaporation and conduction, and potentially some heat being stored. So we have a heat budget, and then we have a mass budget in terms of the green, line, the green um, letters here, the green terms. Um, this one here is the food coming in, and then this is metabolism. This is uh, a term relating to uh, the material that's being put into growth, reproduction, storage, and what's uh, coming out as product or feces. So this is a mass budget term. There's also a mass budget term relating to the respiration, which is um, oxygen being breathed in, the uh, metabolic term, the uh, heat production term, and then the CO2 being produced, the nitrogenous waste being produced, and the water being produced through the metabolism, which is basically this little equation down here, um, the Krebs cycle. And we have a water budget, which has water being ingested, which is coming in through the food, may also be through drinking, but that water from the metabolism is coming in. And then you have losses through the urine, which is tied to the nitrogenous waste, um, water coming in through the feces, which is tied to the feces production, and water being stored, as well as water being exchanged through the process of evaporation. So these are these coupled equations, they're coupling energy and mass flows. You can see these dashed circles represent couplings of energy and mass flows. Quite obviously, we have a coupling with energy and mass flow in terms of evaporation. There's heat being lost or sometimes gained through the project processes of evaporation and condensation, um, but there's also uh, mass being exchanged the actual mass of the water, and the same with, um, with the metabolism term. So this scheme is the thermodynamic niche. It's, um, it's the core of what um, I'm describing as a mechanistic niche model. And each of these terms you can break out and you'll find that it has traits um, that we need to measure about the organism. And it also has environmental variables that we need to know about what the organis organism is experiencing. How do we do it? Well, luckily, all the theory exists. Um, there's These are three books that, um, they're not the only texts to, to, to document these different aspects of the theory we need to do mechanistic niche modeling, but they're really great examples. And one is um, David Gates's book, Biophysical Ecology. And this is all about the processes of heat and water exchange so that, um, the blue and the red equations in the in, in the previous um, diagram, and um, the uh, book by uh, Campbell and Norman called Environmental Biophysics. It's a great book about microclimates and microclimates, in especially in the terrestrial realm, are half the challenge here in trying to do a mechanistic niche model because it's not enough to know what the ambient conditions are, what the climate is, or what the weather is um, to solve these kinds of equations. You need to know the environment actually experienced by the organism, and that's microclimate. And then in terms of the energy budget, um, there's a very powerful metabolic theory called dynamic energy budget theory, um, which in my opinion is the only suitable existing theory for doing this kind of thing. And, it, and, and I find that it works really well as a way of uh, integrating the metabolism um, with the heat exchange and water exchange. So, what I'll do is um, expand upon the concepts in each of these books, but if, like they're books, and so obviously it's going to be um, just very, very cursory treatment. But hopefully, we'll give you a feeling of the power of um, modeling species constraints according to these thermodynamic constraints.